Yes, so our main topic today is on resident-led and collective housing development as a model for Aotearoa. It is in conjunction with the Urban Habitat Collective, and we have Bronwyn Newton with us today to share about her particular project and how it looks on the ground in a particular place. Because there's so much variation, um, Bronwyn's going to share her real-life experience and uh, hopefully in the future, we're going to have other people coming on to share how their particular resident-led um, and collective housing development has gone. So we really get a, a wider understanding of how this model can work in different parts of the country in different formats. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself as well. So I'm Zola. I'm working with Common Ground, which is set up for regenerative housing. And regenerative is quite a broad term. It does include uh, an element of resident or community involvement and participation. And it also includes elements of uh, ecological consideration and uh, being able to speak to the wider systems that any project could seek to uh, influence and positively make an impact on. So that regenerative idea is really that we have systemic issues and within a particular project, we can actually deal with some of those systemic problems in a place-based way. Uh, whether it's ecological, uh, social, uh, economic, and in this case for housing, it would be all three of those things. Peter, you're next in line underneath my screen. So would you like to share why you're here today and just a little bit about yourself? And yeah, yeah sure. I, I'm Peter Southwick. I, um, I've been passionate about housing for a long time. I think we have a better society when people own their own homes. Um, and so I've been a property developer, I've built affordable housing, I've had five years on the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust helping build housing, I've recently joined the Waikato Community Land Trust, um, and so I'm interested in all types of housing that find a way to get people into houses, so um, I've obviously been speaking with Zola over the last year and I'm just interested in everything that she has to offer and learning more about, um, you know, anything I don't know about. And I don't really know that much about resident led collective housing. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Bronwyn. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, and next we have Ellie. Would you like to share, Ellie, about your interest in being here today? Um, well, I'm probably the newest kid on the block. I have just bought a farm. Um, the only experience I've had with farming in the past has been my father owning a, a horse stud farm. And so that's not the least bit uh, that I'm interested in at the moment. I want to go uh, make an opportunity for community um, organic farming. So I bought 24 and a half hectares at Omanawa. And I go unconditional probably tomorrow, but it's on. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> wow, big, big project. And um, that's very ex an exciting place to be. And hopefully you're going to get some, um, some knowledge out of this. And then we look forward to following your uh, journey along this way. Thanks, Ellie, for joining us. And I'll be happy to have as many participants as want to come and join me. <laughs> I got a lot to learn. That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. that's wonderful about this journey. A lot of us are learning together. So that's the point of us coming together is that we can share uh, what we learn and, and make it easier for each one of us. So thanks, Ellie. Zola, while you have the computer here, can I introduce my friend Teddy? Because she is sharing my computer at the moment. <laughs> Sure. Okay. I've, I've registered and my um, phone sitting over there, but I haven't come on. So I'm sitting with Ali as well um, and joining whatever it is we have to learn together on this land. So I'm, I'm the lucky one that's been invited to participate in this project as well. So I'm newbie too. have a little bit of farming background, a little bit of organic background, love all that and wanting to actually get this land used, as this gentleman was saying, used properly. So as it can't be destroyed, so as we can hold on to something that is going to be for the best of everybody, including the land. 
That that that's right. That sounds like um, that regenerative piece that I was talking about earlier. It sounds like your piece of land is a, a wonderful opportunity to use that framework. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Anya, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Anya, and I live in Wanaka. And I think I ran into Peter a few years back when I was trying to get um, into an affordable home, but um, couldn't. And I ended up building my own tiny house. And I've been living in a tiny house for four years now on wheels and I'm renting land. And it's just um, really, I feel that the changes now where a lot of people are thinking the old ways are not working anymore. And for me, tiny houses are um, one of the solutions where it's the minimal land disturbance um, and not being so um, greedy with the space that you take up and just regenerative is just gives me the, the warm fuzzies. Mm -hmm. So um, we've started the trust, uh, Upper Clutha Tiny House Community Trust during lockdown and we are working on models where we can then go to the Queenstown Lakes Housing Trust and say, this is how one of the avenues for affordability and um, just accessibility could work and community. So yeah, I'm sucking it all in. I'm trying to get as much um, uh, research in as possible to take our trust and then go and talk to the council and uh, collaborate with other people. What they're doing in the country is amazing. It's a wonderful energy. So thank you. That's putting this on, Zola. This is great. Oh, great. Well, thanks for joining us and bringing that element of what you bring to the tiny home movement, wanting to create community with that, and looking at partnership and how, how the setup mm -hmm. trust could work um, for that purpose. So that's wonderful. I love the uh, cross the uh, pollination uh, that's mm -hmm. able to happen in these spaces. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Uh, Teddy is not currently at the video, but let's move to Donna. Um, welcome, Donna. Would you like to, you're welcome to unmute yourself. We were just sharing what brings us here today. Sure. Um, so my background is in um, architecture. I'm a registered architect and I've been working as a project manager for uh, a very long time, much longer than I practiced as an architect. Um, and I am an independent advisor to the Otautahi Community Housing Trust. I've been doing, working with them for uh, three or four years now. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, some of you will know, I'm, I'm a member of the interim uh, committee for the Society of Alternative Housing Developments. Um, and my interest in this space is really, um, as part of my training as an architect, um, my observations in the media are around how um, how the problem or the the, the challenge of, of housing is presented and the, the dialogue is framed up. Um, I'm really interested in, in sort of advocacy at local government and central government level, um, both in terms of, of um, removing barriers for alternative um, development options, but also changing the way local authorities um, work with developers, because it just breaks my heart looking at some of these um, development, um, developer-led subdivisions. Uh, they're just soulless, um, they're, they're terrible for, um, for the kind of community um, that we, we want to see in this country and the kind of community that I grew up in. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm recently, I was, my last role prior to COVID was a, a, as the project director for the um, domestic jet hub terminal at Auckland Airport. <laughs> Um, obviously COVID put an end to that. So um, I'm really, uh, over the past year, I've really thought a lot about what I want to be, what I want to be putting my, my heart and soul into um, and what really matters to me. So, so that's why I'm here. Wanting to learn as much as possible. 
Well, that's wonderful to have a, a systems disruptor. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a regenerative term uh, that is about, yes, we want to actually not only do this um, in our for ourselves or in one place, but we actually realize there's a whole systems change that needs to happen. And, um, and there are those of us that are working at that level um, at, at, in these societies. But we also need the real life examples to be able to say, yes, it does work to make influence. So thank you, Donna, for co uh, coming along. Uh, we have um, a few people that look like maybe they're on video and mute, but you are welcome to share. Hello, Pilar, would you like to share with us what brings you here today? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Pilar and um, I am an architect and an urban designer. Um, I have uh, been very interested in uh, of course, sustainable developments and ways to develop residential um, in a way that uh, we optimize the use of the land, um, get into a right balance for um, giving opportunities to the community to form together. <clears throat> that means sharing, um, not only uh, trying to bring your fences up and isolate from your neighbors, um, so what I've been doing, uh, it's um, a bit of uh, working in every different environment from uh, Oakland Council to um, design purely, or um, now I'm giving support and advice to um, developers who are intensifying, like uh, developing brownfields, and they want to get uh, a bit more density and I help them trying to get that right balance. Well, that makes it more attractive to uh, that market of people who are the first home buyers and uh, people who don't own a car, don't wanna own a car. And uh, we choose the sites that we're gonna develop uh, in proximity to train stations in Wellington or uh, Auckland. And uh, we take it from there, trying to make the most of the site, which is a sustainable use of the land um, that's ready to be developed um, as a um, as a contrast with the new developments in green fields, which take up a lot more resources. Uh, so um, I've been also um, getting certified as a green star. Uh, community accredited professional and uh, as a living building future that I'm working on that trying to learn it's always something new we can bring to the table and uh, just um, I'm here to get to know all of you to expand a bit my um, my network in New Zealand because uh, you might have noticed I'm not a Kiwi and uh, not only for my not blonde hair uh, so, uh, yeah, expanding my horizons with like-minded people and looking for some work opportunities and, and see how can we make it happen all together. Wonderful. Thank you, Pilar. Yes, it's nice to hear you've got that ecological and design uh, background as well that you bring to that um, to this conversation. Thank you. Was there anyone else? I see Nicholas. Um, Teddy doesn't look like they're at there. Nicholas, would you like to share what brings you here today? Sure, Zola. Well, I've met you through LinkedIn. I think that's right, with uh, quite a few overlapping <clears throat> interests. But uh, I work in a state government department, which is uh, for social housing. And that's had many, many changes, I suppose, in direction. And we've just seen uh, Victoria commit to a very large spend, which I think is overdue for all social housing providers because their stock is getting low and, uh, sorry, old <clears throat> and low and needs replacement. But I suppose in some ways there'd be other people that you might be familiar with, like the Jason Twills of the world, who are very interested in city mm -hmm. making and especially co-op housing. <clears throat> and I sit on the New South Wales branch of the Australasian Housing Institute, which is mainly full of CHPs. But I think there's a bigger role for co-ops mm -hmm. <clears throat> and certainly going to Berlin, Zurich and Vienna to see the impact that cooperative housing has made on people's lives in terms of not spending their entire money on um, bank debt <clears throat> or huge rents, 
And I just think they've really got the um, approach correct. And uh, the people, when one of the, as an architect, one of the most interesting things was the developments were um, designed to very strong, very high build quality. <clears throat> uh, so it wasn't so much about good design that was given, that was a given, but a very strong build quality so that the, well, that's not me. Who's that? <clears throat> Someone's that's run me. off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the so the build quality was very interesting to me because I think if you're going to build, you want to build for over 50 years, which is not impossible. And uh, so I was listening to that, but also the very clever way that a uh, a person who's involved in the co-op, if they have a change of job or a life and they can't afford the rents they're paying, uh, they can move to a smaller apartment in the um, co-op building and uh, therefore not have to lo lose their uh, community connection. So I was fascinated by that because I was just listening to a guy called Yin uh, Paradis. Uh, he's down at Deakin, I think, and he was just talking about uh, the number of times we move for a job and move for everything else and how that impacts on our community connection and we lose that. So I think co-ops are a very good way. And even uh, your previous speaker was talking about um, her tiny homes and I've got a friend on a multiple occupancy and she's happy there. It, it's what she can afford and she, it's the right sort of land ownership that she's interested in and we have very little diversity in land ownership and i'm interested in how that can be changed oh that's great thank you nicholas um for your wide range of experience and for bringing it into that community housing provider space because i do yeah. believe resident-led housing is all the way from people who who could buy in the market and who are at that uh, level um, all the way through to being able for government to utilize it. And, and we're going to be talking about that in this presentation. So, cool. um, so we'll go on with uh, the presentation that um, I've prepared. And then Bronwyn, who is our uh, guest presenter for the Urban Habitat Collective, will bring us down to a particular place and a particular project. So in terms of uh, resident-led, uh, there's many different types and you might hear these terms utilized. So co-housing is resident led and collective with a focus on common spaces and facilities and with a focus on social cohesion and the process of designing collaboratively. Can look like an apartment, it can look like um, a rural uh, space. The tiny home community uh, which Anya here is representing today, which is looking at how tiny homes can share common spaces and facilities and perhaps even that social dynamic of co uh, collective decision making. Then there's the eco village, which is basically anything again can be an eco village, but it's really about the principles that guide the creation and the ongoing operation of that housing development. And so we have done another presentation last month uh, in the Coming Ground YouTube channel, you will find the presentation there, and that covers the whole gamut of what is um, the Eco Village concept and what it looks like. Then there's the Community Lands Trust, which uh, Peter is representing here today. That is a land legal tenure created uh, for retained affordability, community stability, and community stewardship um, and, and inclusion. So, that again, um, some other of these models can happen on top of a community land trust, um, but uh, so that can look again in different forms from a rural to an apartment. There is the cooperative housing, which Nicholas has mentioned, which is an ownership model uh, with a focus on affordability, but also obviously that social cohesion, being able to have a voice um, in that ownership. And then there's Papakainga, which is um, on Maori owned land and it's usually family led. Some of these can be layered so that you can have a tiny home community that is on a community land trust that calls itself an eco village. So they're not um, exclusive to each other. So some of the pieces that um, when we're thinking about what really makes up resident led and collective, I would say to start with the purpose because you saw all those different ones that uh, in the previous slide have different purposes. Some are for um, ending gentrification. Some have a more ecological purpose. Some have more of an affordability purpose and really being clear on what are the values um, of that project? What's the vision hoping to achieve? What's the greater purpose that it have has not only for the residents, but um, is there other purposes beyond that? So then in that case, you would need a framework, which would be the guidelines, which would help 
to develop those decisions and processes so that you're able to really make sure that you, you have a framework that you're always with everything that you do. Uh, proceeding from there is being able to still um, meet those visions, values, and the purpose. So another piece is the social structures to think about, and there is group decision-making. Um, how are you gonna do that? Conflict resolution, shared spaces and activities, the creation of and management of, and then the membership structure and the roles. There's the legal aspects, which would be around the legal for land ownership, the legal for building ownership, and to ensure that there is security of tenure. The financial pieces uh, to make sure that um, there's affordability in some form or another. You're going to hear Bronwyn talk about non-speculative affordability. Um, a community land trust is set up for retained affordability in the long term. And you might then have operational affordability while folks are living there. How are they also living more affordably? Then there's um, the financial uh, organizing the finance, and if it's got a bigger purpose, there could also be funding that can be organized. And then there's the ecological considerations, how uh, the land use is going to be designed, the choice of building materials, and then how water, energy, and waste will be considered. And that is all sitting within a larger, um, could be a watershed, that we consider how is uh, ecologically our um, community contributing in a positive way to that watershed. And then this I've designed, which it's not a, a finished, but a, it is something that I've started to work with, which is really sort of that pathway that groups can think about, or if it's a nonprofit organization like a community lands trust or a community housing provider, these are still, you might not have all of these steps, but you'll definitely have some of them. And um, I've kind of put the ones towards the people at the ones that you'd reached at the beginning, but it's not necessarily so. So this is not necessarily chronological. So in terms of what's inside that pathway, those are the things that the group has a little bit more sort of control over or can do internally. Those are also the things I've identified that common ground that I'm able to help groups um, and organizations with as well. So again, starting with vision, values, and principles, looking at holistic decision-making, that was that framework, uh, looking at regenerative design and outcomes, if the project has that as part of their uh, value is to be regenerative, needing criteria to choose the land. Um, Pilar talked about that, about the difference between the brown fields and green fields and why one might choose one over the other. Looking at your ownership model, Nicholas talked about the cooperative. So if that's uh, what kind of ownership model do you want or do you want var a variation of ownership models? Actually, that, that can be the case that on a piece of land, there's various different types, could have tiny home and a cooperative um, and a, um, another type of, um, of ownership. And then you have your membership structure then the roles and skills of members and stakeholders. You know, what do you have internally that you could use and what do you need to upskill and where do you need to bring in those extra skills? Um, then you have group dynamics and communication, uh, land use design, and you've got, um, when you come down to putting it onto um, the ground, you've got project management with its actions, resources, and timelines. And then moving on to the development of the site, You'd also, outside of that pathway, uh, you'd need to consult a legal person to get that land legal structure sorted. Um, and another one is the design of the dwellings. You might call on Pilar for, for something like that, an architect who's um, into this sort of thing. And your infrastructure design would, uh, uh, again, be around that water, waste, and energy. Again, if you're thinking ecologically, that would look differently. And then uh, Pilar also spoke about that Green Star and Living Future certification. Do you want your project to be able to uh, get a certification? And then there's processes that need to be followed and um, practitioners who can help you with that. There's the zoning and consent. It sort of goes along with the land legal structure, but that's more involving your local councils. And um, again, some of the things that you do in that inside piece could influence the zoning and consent. Like what um, Peter was saying with the community lands trust, if it's using that model, 
then you've got other pieces uh, that you might have available like inclusionary zoning, and you might be able to influence um, some of the consents or some of the costs around that if you've got a for purpose or a, a nonprofit um, piece of what you're doing. And then you've got the finance structure and access to finance. And that is very much a changing uh, landscape here in Aotearoa because we've got now, um, now shared equity coming in and lower deposits. And so banks are starting to catch on that housing needs to be financed differently. And uh, for instance, the Queen Town Lakes uh, Community Housing Trust works with the SBS Bank because they're more familiar with this kind of a model of shared equity um, and working with this organization on behalf of the homeowners. And so hopefully we'll see more banks and um, financing institutions stepping in to do things differently and allowing it to be easier um, to access finance. And then development on the site, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously it would help if you get most of these other things uh, figured out before you move into that piece. Now, Bronwyn's gonna be sharing us with us about non-speculative development, which is again, touching on that affordability piece, which is that building without uh, the profit motive. And uh, she'll touch probably more on these things. I just thought to get, I put together a few things um, about why would we want to do it this way? Because it's easier to reflect the residents' values and needs. It is more affordable. Uh, there are more opportunities then to develop the housing uh, site using a regenerative framework. So you're asking different questions rather than what's the profit am I gonna get out of it? You're asking questions like, what are gonna be the social outcomes and what are gonna be the environmental outcomes that we can also achieve by building differently. Um, it does build community in the process because you know, people are having to work together to make decisions from, from the beginning. It is empowering. People feel like, yes, I can be a part of the solution. I don't have to wait for um, government or a, a developer to just provide me with a house. And um, it obviously increases the available houses that we have, which we definitely need. And then I just wanted to share this as well. Um, again, a, a plug for integrated design, because that's something that I'd like really like to see more of and, and the reason why. So we obviously want better environmental outcomes. We have mandates within our government that we have to do that. And we want better social outcomes. And we also want affordability. That can be a factor that's used against a better development because um, it's you know, rise in cost, but that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, we, we also look at what builds community wealth. And so if we look at conventional housing as it is at the moment, it's actually quite low in both of those categories. So why would we want to carry on? I, I <laughs> That's a good question. I think we need to keep asking ourselves, why do we carry on with the conventional? So then we've got things like Green Star, uh, communities and buildings, and that is houses that are built with better materials and that are using better processes. And that does um, will be affordable, I think, over time in terms of if you've got uh, better building materials that insulate better and that um, are, are better with uh, power usage and things like that, you end up with affordability over time. And then if we look at an integrated systems design, which moves into that re using a regenerative framework, you end up with houses and neighborhoods that definitely are achieving simultaneously the environmental outcomes, the social, and it actually can create, well, definitely creates affordability over time and increases community wealth. So why not do that? Um, and it's just a matter of just learning, you know, seeing uh, what is possible and, and upskilling ourselves and being able to speak out when we see conventional housing and being able to question, why are we still doing it this way? So there's actually a wealth of community-led and collective housing in Aotearoa. Some are already established, some are busy getting established. And this is certainly not an inclusive list. This is just what I put together quickly right now. Uh, in the Eco Village video, I share some that are specifically under that banner. Then there's the community-led um, uh, community lands trust video where we share other um, communities here in Aotearoa. And then here's another list. And it's my one of my work is to put together a list where we're able to see, oh, what is this um, 
community and where is it and what kind of a community are they? So just to go over briefly, we'll have uh, hear from Bronwyn about the Urban Habitat Collective, which is urban, it's in the heart of Wellington, and it is uh, using a co-housing concept of sharing um, and collective decision-making, and it's also an apartment. There's co-house, which uh, is urban in Auckland. It's using co-housing, it, that's what it's called, and it is more higher density. We have Lotus Eco Village, which I covered in the Eco Village presentation with Ralph as one of the co-founders, and that's semi-rural in Paraparaumu. We have Tayora High Street Co-housing in Dunedin, which is urban and higher density. We have Tui Community, that's one of the oldest in the country at Wainui Bay, and it's rural and considers itself an eco-village. We have Cambridge Co-housing, which is in my neighborhood, in Peter's neighborhood as well. And they've been um, formed as a group for about almost three years now and are at the process of um, talking with developers with their vision. And um, they've been doing a lot of that social architecture piece, uh, getting themselves ready for the land. And then Earth Song, again, which is one of the oldest, it's a co-housing up in Auckland and that welcomes visitors on a quarterly basis to have a tour and to see all of what they're about. And they have an ecological focus. And then I had invited a member of the co-house community to share with us, but at the last minute they weren't able to make it. And so I said, okay, I'll share some. He was gonna sh share a little bit about um, how that where they are. And they're hopefully gonna be moving in in April. And this is kind of the latest posting. They have a Twitter account. And so this is where I got these uh, most recent posts from. And uh, if you want, you can visit their website and learn more about them. And so just to leave you with some positive that there is support growing for this. Again, this is not inclusive. This is kind of what I know right now. And again, if any of you have input to help me to understand the, you know, the bigger ecosystem that the, the role players uh, that are working here, at the moment, there's uh, me with Common Ground. There is the Society for Alternative Housing Development. We are in the process of a name change, and Donna is a part of that, and maybe some of the rest of you. And then there's a Society for Cooperative Housing, where we're developing toolkits to be able to spread that cooperative housing model because it's very unknown here in New Zealand. So we want to be able to pilot it in a particular site and then uh, be able to utilize the toolkit, say that it works, and then we'll be sharing that toolkit out. And there actually is, um, I didn't mention it here, but there is um, Te Puni Kokari, which is the Maori housing, and they've developed some toolkits for the Papakaina development. There's um, one for the Bay of Plenty, there's one for the Waikato, and I think those are actually really useful toolkits as well that can be utilized hand in hand with um, another development because there's a lot of steps that would be um, with any resident led in collective housing. And um, it also is reflective of the policies um, that are within that particular area. So another resource you can get from uh, Tikuni Kokiri. So that's it for my part of the presentation. And I'm going to open it up to Bronwyn to share about the Urban Habitat Collective, and then we'll leave plenty of time for you to ask your specific question. So Thank Bronwyn, you. go for it. Sure. Oh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Bronwyn Newton tāko ingoa nō whanganui a tāra tēn a, a hau. Um, I am the kai uh, whakateri of the Urban Habitat Collective. I'm the project navigator and one of the founders. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. It's so great that so many people are interested in alternative ways of doing housing. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. What I thought I'd do is just, I've got some slides. So I thought I'd run quickly through them to give you an idea of our project and our people and kind of where we're at. And then I know Zola has um, put um, a, communicated a few points that we'll be covering so I'll just I'll move I'll I'll flick back to me and then I'll um I will um uh answer those as best I can and then I will uh, you know leave plenty of time to answer your questions so now can you all see that yes give me a thumbs up if you great 
So we are the Urban Habitat Collective. We've been working together for about three years now. It was November, November 2017 that I met Jesse Matthews, who is my co-founder and, and is now the, the architect on the, the project. Um, we got together and started talking about housing and realized that we couldn't buy the kind of houses that we wanted to live in. We didn't want to live in a glass box in the sky and we didn't want to live in a sprawling suburb and we didn't see any other options. And we thought, you know, if there's going to be better options, we might just have to build them ourselves. So fortunately, we attracted some like-minded people fairly quickly in our, in our journey, um, which is a, was a, a key stroke of luck. And we also got it quickly got into negotiations with um, some landowners. This is the site that we've bought. This is what it used to look like at Kiora Sheet Metal in Adelaide Road. It's one of, it was one of those old Victorian type uh, workshops. And I imagine that every tradesperson in Wellington had said to Brian at some point or another, you know, when you want to retire, just let me know and I'll come and buy the building off you. Fortunately, we got in, we got in first. And, um, and they were really supportive of our concept, not so supportive that they wanted to give us a huge discount, but they did at least negotiate with us and, um, and we, we agreed a price. Um, it was fairly significant and um, above valuation, but it was what we had to do to secure the, the land. And uh, it is one of the things about a co-housing project that is such a paradox, you know, you can't put a group together if you don't have a site and it's very hard to get a site when you don't have a group. So it was one of those things where so many of the things had lined up in terms of the location. We had a core group of about eight families who were willing to put money in and uh, and we were able to have a deferred settlement of about 15 months, which meant that we had time to put together the rest of our group. So we settled in July and then it started to look like this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we now have an empty site. Um, and this is what we are planning to build there. We are now 24 families, so we, we're building 24 apartments, 18 in that large apartment building that you see at the front and six in the small building at the back with a, a shared garden in between. And in the bottom uh, layer, this is the, the shared garden and then on the left of your screen there is where the, the shared common room with kitchen, we will be able to do meals and those kind of things. So all of the apartments are self-contained. Everybody has their own kitchen, living room, all of those kind of things, but we also have shared amenities. So it's our it's our quarter acre dream. The section is 914 square meters, which is pretty much a quarter acre. Here's a, the layout of the ground floor. So you can see the shared areas. We have a, a on the top left there, a workshop and storage and bike storage. We have a guest room so that people don't have to have a spare room um, of their own that they can they're going to can book grandma in when she's coming to visit from out of town and then at the bottom right there this is the the common room and then as required by the district plan we have uh, these two commercial spaces which we plan to sell we have parking for five cars and we're planning to do a car share for the building so that um, we can reduce our number of cars it's going to be interesting um, it's meant that a lot of people uh, some people are really clear that they don't want to use cars very much and uh, some of us have some quite high car needs and have a little bit of concern about whether we can make car share work but um, we're all just sort of reserving our reserving judgment until we're until we're in all the the research seems to say that five cars should be sufficient given that we're on a really good bus route and we're you know within sort of 10 or 15 minutes walk to town so um, that's going to be interesting so obviously shared garden there and we also have a shared roof deck so um, that will we uh, in terms of trying to do some cost saving we we had some intense conversations about whether in fact we could afford the roof deck and uh, there was a spirited defense of the roof deck by introverts they said that the rest of the, the shared spaces are uh, designed for extroverts but they feel, felt that that the, the roof was going to be particularly well used by people who wanted a little bit of peaceful time with the stars so um, yes, we're well, looking forward to that. I've just moved on here to the, uh, to the layout of the apartments. As you can see, two apartments in the, the small building on the left and, and three in the large building on the right. One of the things that we've been able to do as a, a resident-led, you know, with resident-led decision-making is that we, our access to our apartments is across shared decks which of course wouldn't happen in a developer-led development because you know if you're the person living in in um, 
an apartment 1B here and people from 1A are walking across in front of your house, you might go, hey, I, why are you walking on my deck? When you know all of these people and they're your friends, the idea that your neighbor might walk in front of your house while they're trying to get to their own house is not a problem. It also means that we don't have creepy corridors, which was a pet peeve of mine. You know, the creepy corridors and apartment buildings that feel like everybody's died. They're so quiet and so eerie. So I'm, I'm very glad that we don't have any of those. So, yes, and here we are. This is the day that we settled the land. This is um, our uh, a large part of our group. As you can see, we're, we're quite diverse and we're quite diverse in, in age and, um, and, and attitude. Mostly Pākehā, although we, um, we, we did go do, do a bit of a run through of languages spoken and, um, and yes, we, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, Spanish, we have some Spanish and Māori speakers and um, some uh, Italian speakers. So uh, yeah, as you can, you, you can probably even tell from the, the photo that they are just a really lovely bunch. It's a, they're a really fantastic group. So yeah, we're going to be fitting quite a few more people on a quarter acre than you would usually expect. So we have, we're 47 people, 21 men and 26 women. We have uh, nine kids, seven boys and two girls. And as you see, two babies. Um, yeah, getting, getting families with kids has been one of the hardest things about the recruitment for the project because it's, it's, not, it's not a cheap exercise. And also, you know, when you have small children, it's not really the time that you feel... Um, that you have a lot of spare time to attend lots of meetings and make lots of life-changing decisions. So we're really fortunate to have um, five families with kids. So we've got three intergenerational families. So when where we've got um, we've got parents and children, you know, adult children and and older parents, and also one three generational. So where we've got we've got the the grandparents and the parents and the small children um, living in two apartments next to each other, which we're really looking forward to. We've got quite an age spread. So our youngest member, Alma, is two weeks old, four weeks old now. <laughs> and uh, yes, and our oldest member, who's almost 80. And the, quite a good division between singles and couples. And as I say, just five families with kids. We also have pets. So that's always an interesting conversation. Um, in fact, talking to Robin Allison from Earth Song, she said the most intense debates that they had uh, and discussions that they had in their formation were about pets and I can quite uh, identify with that. So, so here are some of the just the, the renders of what our apartments will look like. As you can see, um, as, and as you would have seen from the, the plan, all of our apartments have two or possibly three aspects. So um, this, this one is the northern apartment. So it has both an east and west and a northern aspect, which we think is going to be really great for airflow and for sun also, the design means that, um, as you can see to the left there, that's, there's a one-story building to our north. And although at some point they will probably build um, an, you know, another apartment building, we'll still get some good afternoon sun no matter what they do. So that's really encouraging because great sun and, um, uh, yeah, and light were an important feature that, that the community was looking for. Here's another example looking out to the hills. And there's the roof deck, um, the carillion in the background. Um, yeah, so, and that's that's the the kitchen, at um, in the looking out onto the onto the shared garden. Yeah. So, getting on to just how we put the group together. Um, it's been a, a really interesting process of of attracting people and of um, of getting their buy-in, we um, we've started sort of from scratch. So so we we didn't particularly we went to visit Earth Song, which was great, and we we learned a lot from um, from talking to uh, the people there and from there's a great book uh, written in California about co-housing, which we we found really helpful. And Robin Allison has actually now just written a book about co-housing. So um, all, all of this information is really valuable, but I think, you know, the, the thing I'd like to get across to people if they're, you know, if they're looking at starting this kind of project is that it really is about the relationships, the personal relationships with the people. It's, um, yeah, you, it's a unique relationship. It's not, it's your friends, but you're not just friends. 
and your colleagues like as if you were working together but you're not just colleagues because you're actually planning your homes together you're committing finances together you are um, you know it's really important that you get on with these people but you get on because you have a common purpose and you have a common goal rather than just because you like someone or because you happen to be related to them or because you have to you know you happen to work for the same boss and uh, that makes it just really rich and interesting. Um, it's one of the things I've really enjoyed about the project is um, we've often, we start to talk about other aspects of things that we need to, we might need to agree about. And it's become quite clear that really what we need to agree about is only things about co-housing. We need to agree about how we're gonna live together, how we're gonna make decisions, how we're gonna be good neighbors. But actually, Beyond that, we want to create room for people to have different views and to be tolerant of those views. So it's been an interesting balancing act of getting to know people and getting to know the things that we do agree on and then deciding whether the stuff that we maybe think differently on is stuff that we really need to tease out or can we just leave it that, you know, we need to agree about co-housing, we need to agree about the way that we treat each other, but actually we don't, we don't need to agree about everything about politics or parenting or the environment or or religion or those kind of things. So, so as part of our community building, we've developed these communication guidelines that, that I've put up on the screen there. And um, that's been helpful. Although, as I say, it's it really is the, the personal connections and communication and affection that are the glue that, that holds the group together. Um, it was interesting talking to Robin Allison the other day because we've been planning to do a dispute resolution sort of policy um, as part of our of our policy sort of and social agreements framework. And I was talking to her about it, and she said, "You know, we don't we don't have one at Earth Song. We we have some processes, but by and large, we rely on communication and relationship to avoid or resolve conflict." rather than having a, a special process that we then rely on. And I just, I found that really encouraging. So another thing that we've borrowed from Earthsong is um, the use of colored cards. So everybody uh, has a set of colored cards and these can be used in um, discussion or decision-making. We uh, practice consensus decision-making, which means that we, we really, ideally we wanna talk about things until we all agree and it's worked amazingly well up until now. Like, um, you know, where we're at now is we're, we're about to get our resource consent. We're about to get a price back from a contractor. So as you can imagine, we have made an awful, we've had an awful lot of meetings and a lot of discussion and made a lot of decisions. And by and large, we, we get to consensus. Um, consensus doesn't necessarily mean a complete agreement. It can mean I have some reservations, but I'm not willing to block this decision. And uh, yeah, it's um, it's a really um, it's a really thorough process, and it's one that um, the this card system has really helped with the the um, just making the conversation work during the meetings, and it also just helps to keep people focused about the fact that we we do want everybody's input and we want to kind of scaffold their their contributions and and how they're feeling about whatever the topic is. So as you can see from there, this is this is how they're used in the discussion format, and then we have then they also used in in the um, decision making format. So that's then the the colours have a slightly different meaning. So um, obviously, yeah, if you're trying to reach a decision, you need a whole room full of green and blue, and uh, yeah. Interestingly, the the orange has also come to mean um, actually. I think. Um, you see here in the discussion, um, the discussion setting that orange means acknowledgement and you know and appreciation. So it's become a thing in our group where you know if somebody does something great or we want to appreciate them, we go you know yes, orange cards to you or a box of oranges. In fact, when when one of our families just had a baby, I took them a whole box of oranges into the hospital. It was quite funny. <laughs> So that's our that's our quarter acre dream. That's um, where we're at at the moment. I'll um, I shall just bring that back to me 
so that I can see you all. So Zola um, put a few bullet points um, around to people to just get clear about what we were going to be covering today. And I just thought that I would um, quickly uh, respond to those and then leave plenty of time for you guys to ask some questions. Is everybody all right with that? Give me a thumbs up if you great. So um, the, the first thing was about why we chose um, this type of housing development and what the benefits are to us and to the city and the housing ecosystem. As I said, the, the, one of the main reasons was we just couldn't find the type of housing that we actually wanted to live in. And we also realized that uh, we would make different decisions from a developer and that's exactly what's happened. So we, the three probably key areas are that we've decided to do less units uh, you know, a developer with a site like ours, um, when the Wellington Company is building a an apartment building down, just down the road from us, and they're putting 93 apartments on the site with um, no green space, no shared space, and only 12 car parks and only probably room for 30 bikes in their bike room. So um, things like that, you know, we think we just think, yeah, we we do definitely make different decisions. So yeah, the garden and the shared space, obviously, you know, they give huge amenity to the group, but they don't come for free. And so that's, that's been a, a decision to allocate resource in that way. And we think that it's going to really um, pay, pay us back in, in terms of the, the activities and enjoyment that we're going to get out of the, the building. The other interesting different decision that we've made is that our, build, our big building is going to be base isolated. And you may think that with Christchurch and with the Kaikoura earthquakes that, that more buildings in Wellington would be base isolated. But the truth is that what, develop, what happens with developers is that they, they, go, they go to get a building designed and then they see how much base isolation costs and they don't do it. We will only be the second base isolated apartment building in Wellington. The first one is being built in Victoria Lane at the moment. So yeah, um, and that is obviously an additional cost, but we believe that um, it will be worth it for keeping our, um, you know, for, for giving our members the feeling of, of security and knowing that we've done everything that we can to protect ourselves from earthquakes. And, um, and that also that there will be some return in terms of, um, in terms of uh, insurability and those kind of things. It also feels like in terms of decision making that the drivers around what people want out of housing are changing. In terms of cost and availability, like obviously just this type of housing is not available unless you build it yourself. Environment, environmental impacts, just that your whole footprint and the idea that you can have some individual space, but you know, to get the full benefits of a garden or a common room, you don't need to own a whole one. You just need to be able to use it and you want to be able to use it with a group of people who you like and trust and and want to spend time with. Um, in terms of community, it's been a really a, a big driver for our group that that people people want community to be easy. And when you live in the suburbs and you work a lot of hours and you spend a lot of time in traffic and you spend a lot of time, you know, you spend long hours at work, there's very little time left over to, to form those kind of community bonds. And that's what people are noticing. And one of the, the key things about our um, project is that we feel like people will be able to get their social needs met very easily. The, the transition from private space to shared space and then back again will happen differently for different people depending on their social needs. And, and it will be seamless. It, it won't be like I'm stuck out in the suburbs or out or in my apartment and I have to, I have to, to, to make social gatherings happen, either, you know, hosting them myself or those kind of things that, that for those, those casual, warm, kind of encouraging social interactions that happen, you know, kind of on the stairs or in the garden or whatever, the, those things will be much more available in our development. So the, um, yeah, the next question that, that Zola had was about how resident-led development differs from conven conventional development. And um, I have to say, big disclaimer here, we have, not, uh, we have not solved affordability. 
In fact, I, I joke that we're innovating middle-class housing. So we were clear right from the beginning that unfortunately nobody was, was introducing any more capital into this process. We are, we're a not-for-profit project. So we, we, nobody is, there's no developer per se. There's no one walking away with a 20% profit. Um, but that um, because we've made other decisions around shared spaces and around the quality of the build and around the number of units and the base isolation, a lot of those savings that we might have made um, through not having a developer and not having to do, you know, marketing and sales and real estate agents, those kind of things have been have been spent on things that we value more. Um, of course, one of the one of the key differences is that that we are because we're resident led, we have twenty four households that want to have input into design decisions, and um, it's part of my job to reassure contractors that they don't need to talk to twenty four households before we make a decision. Um, but we're also trying to reach that balance between um, inclusion and hearing people's views and, and reaching good decisions while also needing to keep moving and to make decisions in a timely way and those kind of things. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's been a really uh, interesting process. And it's, again, getting back to the, to the positive trusting relationships. We have a lovely group of members who... Uh, are fairly quick to say if you think this is the right thing to do if you myself and we have what we call a momentum team which is the the leadership team which anybody can join if they want to we meet weekly and we we do you know we have an agenda in minutes and so people can keep up with what what we're doing and after the, each momentum team meeting we have a newsletter that goes out so um but we've been really fortunate in that we've got quite a, a few members who are who are just really encouraging and really confident that um, you know if the leadership group is is happy that this is a good decision, then they're happy to go along with that. Uh, we also you know we've got other members that sort of engage at, at different levels and in different ways on different issues, and that's that's an important um, yeah it's just an important part of the inclusion type process. It's how you it's how you you welcome in a whole lot of different sorts of people and get them working together. So, yeah, um, in terms of getting started and skills and knowledge, um, to be fair, you know, I'm a property developer, lawyer, play center mother. So uh, that's quite a unique skill set. It means that I, um, the legal stuff doesn't scare me. The, the, I haven't done anything as big as this in the development space. So um, there are aspects of that, that that give me a little bit of, you know, may keep me awake at night, but um and then uh, in terms of being, having been really active in the community, having done, um, you know, I used to joke with my developer friends that, that having organized 40 play center mothers to do a, a center re renovation, nothing in the commercial world has been as tough as that. So <laughs> there's nothing more motivated than the mothers of preschoolers. So, um, and I've also, you know, been involved in community groups. And I think it's, it, for people who've done that type of work, I think we get, a, a real insight into how to engage people, how to motivate people, and how to, to just weave together different skills and different uh, reasons for being engaged. And it's, it's quite different than when you are employing someone, because obviously when you employ somebody, you, you have a job description, you pay them, you know, there's a set of expectations about why they will do, you know, they'll do as they're told, and they'll also, they'll show some initiative. And But yeah, when you're a group of volunteers, especially people who are building their homes together and contributing an awful lot of, of they're taking a lot of risk and they're taking, they're contributing a lot of capital. Um, it is really, um, it's a, it's a very intense process, but incredibly satisfying. Um, yeah. And Robin Allison talks about this in her, in her book. And also, you know, um, when she, when she got, gives co-housing sort of speeches, talks about the burning soul. So this, this idea that, that, projects like ours sort of need one person who's willing to stand in the fire for as many years as it takes. And that does appear to have been the, the truth of it up until this point, but I would really like, I would really like that it, that it doesn't take that because um, I think that requirement just means that you, there's a limited number of people who have the resources and skills and risk appetite to do that and if that's a requirement then then we never go this, these things are never going to be common 
and uh, I think it's the changes in the system that we need, we need to look at to enable other people, you know, to, to that we can move away from that sort of process and be more, have it be more collect, collective and collaborative. So, um, yeah, moving on to just how, how councils and central government could uh, support these kind of projects. Um, you know, it's been really interesting to hear about the community land trust um, aspect, especially what Peter was saying about, you know, the, the private profit being made from the rezoning. I think there's a huge amount of potential there to just acknowledge that, that the, the community needs to retain those benefits rather than having them go to private interests. And, and there are very few levers that, that uh, local government has. You know, they don't have a huge amount of money. They are overstretched in terms of their rates and the infrastructure that they have to pay for and the stuff that they're made responsible for. So it's, it's not easy just to say, well, why doesn't, why doesn't central, any local or central government just buy land? But one of the things that they do have is the zoning, is zoning requirements. And actually, and I know this will be kind of controversial, the heritage requirements, because I do wonder whether, you know, if we, if we start to have the heritage requirement conversation, it's a whole different gig when you're, if you remove the heritage protections from a property, but then the benefits of that removal accrue to the community rather than to an individual land owner, then I think that's, that's kind of a, um, a, a halfway house between, um, you know, can we really afford those heritage values versus, well, if, if we don't have them, then we'll get more housing, but, but we'll also generate a lot more private profit. So, um, one of the things that the I'm, I'm also involved in the Society for Alternative Housing Development, and one of the things that we're talking about is this idea of having of defining what a qualifying project looks like, so that council or government can look at benefits that might accrue to those projects. So it would be things like that they're not for profit, that they're community led, that they um, that they're transparent, that they have environmental and social goals, and that they have some kind of longevity and sustainability and affordability. We haven't yet kind of really refined what that might look like. But once you have said, well, projects that look like this qualify for these benefits, um, I think you would make it a lot more attractive for people who are willing to work in this way. Of course, you have to be quite careful because uh, developers, uh, and I was one, so I get to say, <laughs> are quite motivated for finding loopholes and for um, and quite savvy in their, you know, in their dealings. So if you're going to create benefits or, or particular vehicles, you have to be really clear that you're not suddenly allowing somebody to sort of masquerade as something and then walk off with the profits privately. So that's, of course, a, a consideration. Uh, another area that we would really like some clarification around is with um, taxation. We've had to do a bit of work. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize. There's a, the potential for a project like ours, which is a quite conservative um, land holding in the end. So we, we're just going to be a unit title development with a body corp in the same way as any other any other apartment building but obviously with more shared areas and therefore a more active sort of body corp situation. However, there is a danger that we could be seen um, as being a development company who is then transferring unit titles to its own shareholders and that that could be seen as an associated party transaction which has to happen at market value. And um, obviously if that were the case, then any savings that we've made would be become profit and be taxable, despite the fact that it's our, our shareholders who have paid for their units all the way along. So what we've um, what we've done is taken tax advice and our structure is such that our, our sort of narrative is that our people have, have bought their units right at the beginning of their membership of the project. And that what they've done as we've gone along is just contributed more and more money of their own money to the buying of their apartment and those rights have been crystallizing as the project progresses and the issue of the title is just the crystallization of their ownership that has actually existed right from the beginning of their membership. Now to support this, we've had to not be registered for GST because obviously when you're 
when you're a developer and or when you're creating things for sale, you, you claim back GST while you're making the thing and then you charge it at the end. Well, that's not what we're doing. We, we are the, the final consumers of the goods and services. But what that does also mean for our cash flow is that we have to pay GST as we go. So, um, but we figure that um, that's, that's what's consistent with our, with our tax position. And, but it has required a lot of advice and some, you know, in the drafting of agreements and those kind of things. And it just seems a little unfair that we have to deal with that, given that if we were building 24 houses in the suburbs and they happen to be worth more by the end of the development, that the commissioner would not be coming and asking for um, any tax on the difference between their cost and their current value. So that's one thing that we would really like um, clarified in the next little while. Um, so in, yeah, just a little bit more on the legal and social frameworks. Um, we are, we're a collective, so we're, we are equal shareholders in, in the company. We have complete transparency. So all of our uh, people can see, like all of our transactions go through zero and everybody can see those. Um, we have a big Google Drive with all of the documents, all of the minutes, all of the everything. And it's a little bit of a trick to um, balance, you know, obviously too much information is a bit overwhelmed. So we also try to do newsletters and summaries and those kind of things to make sure that people are, um, are involved and, you know, and really do understand. Um, we devolve a lot of work into working circles. So we have a community circle, a finance and legal design and build, um, and recruitment, comms and recruitment. And that means that we have smaller groups working on things. And it's just part of that trusting relationship that you, you know, you're, you, um, you're encouraged that, that good things are happening, even if you're not necessarily involved in all of them all of the time. So, yeah. And um, yeah, in terms of financials and um, those kind of technical things, as I say, we, we haven't cracked affordability, unfortunately. Our, um, so our apartments are going to be a good, a good deal in the end. We've just had them revalued and the, they've gone up by 8.5% and they're a good 10% above um, the, the value is above the projected cost at the moment. But we do, unfortunately, um, we need a 30% deposit from people, which means that it, that's quite a high bar to participate. Part of what the way that we've managed it is we've we've had a financial advisor who has vetted people to make sure that they are financially able to participate, and he's also developing a profile of the group for um, confirming finance with the bank, and um, he's he's been talking to the banks and um, yeah, obviously you have to do all of this without getting any confirmation from banks because they won't confirm anything until you have until you have drawings, until you have a price, until you have, you know, all of these kind of things. So it does mean that you uh, you have to work a lot on faith that um, that you're going to be able to pull it all together in the end. But every indication is that that will be fine. And um, yeah, that's what we're working on at the moment. So um, and part of that is, um, you know, to to uh, work in that on those things, we've done an early engagement process with our preferred contractor and that's been really really helpful so they've this is um homes construction so it's a it's a, a an appropriately sized firm to do this this type of work and they've been involved for the last two years coming to our meetings and advising on the buildability and and just you know advising on products and availability of products and they've just been incredibly um yeah helpful and so we're going to do a negotiated tender with them. So they will they are um, tendering the sub trades, which means that you know we we will get some competitive kind of pricing there. But in terms of our overall price with them, so their carpentry and their their kind of involvement, we'll be negotiating that rather than putting that fully out to tender. And we think that we're going to get a better um, result that way because we feel that if we did a more combative tender process that the risks to the project are that we get somebody who gives us the lowest price and then thinks that they'll fight it out later and you know with 24 households that would just be uh, quite a traumatic build we you know we have a certain amount of money we're going to have to negotiate and either either negotiate with the contractor or refine the design in order to get within our budget but we um there's no point in in uh, in taking a cut price 
rate, but then having to, um, you know, fight for every dollar for the next 14 months. So that's, um, that's been our, and we, we have tried to be conservative in our decision making as we go along. We've, we've definitely, we've got a lot of rounds of, of QSing and to get pricing. And we, we have, for instance, you know, with the geotech, we assumed a C-class um, soil rather than B. We went for a pile design that was quite extendable so that if there were any issues that the extension would not be. So yeah, we've, we've definitely tried to minimize our, our risks. Um, yeah, I think that probably is an awful lot of information for you all. And um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Don't be shy, jump in to <laughs> ask a question, no matter, um, even if you think that Bronwyn can't answer it, it's good to have these questions out there because you know, we need to be able to, to find these solutions. We can always take it back to the Society for Alternative Housing Development and, <laughs> and make it something you know, that uh, we need to know what the issues are, what the barriers are, what the concerns are of community that want to do this sort of thing so that we can um, you know, make it possible. I'll start then, Lola. I've just got a few questions. I'm, I'm always interested in the financials, Bronwyn. So what sort of money are we talking about for a two-bedroom apartment there uh, would be my first question. Sure. Um, so we've got, we, we range from, um, we've got a one tiny studio apartment that's under 500 at the moment. And then um, most of the two bedrooms are in the kind of 850 to 880 um, range so that's yeah um, and they're they're 76 square meters so um, yeah actually maybe a little bit higher night like to night about 9 30 so 8 50 to 9 30 yeah. Um, yeah so the the commensurate with what um, you know with what other developments are selling for in Wellington and those developments don't have shared space they don't have storage they don't have green space they don't have so yeah. Yeah, we're, you know, we're not cheaper, we're just better. Yeah, so we're talking about a total build cost of 18 or $20 million, something like That's that. That's right, yep. And the um, uh, the rental side of it, is anybody allowed to rent them or do you, what's the, what have you so, done on that? Yeah, so we... Um, Everybody is owner is is owner occupiers at the moment, but that won't be a requirement going forward. Um, so if people um, like, obviously we we're trying to build community, and if um, and we want people to act in a way that that supports that, but we appreciate that we need high quality, secure rentals in in housing also, and we also appreciate that a lot of our people have family overseas, they want to go on sabbaticals, they want to go and do those kind of things. And we don't want to get in the way of that. So we're just trying to kind of walk that line between um, wanting people to act in towards the community in a way that is not, you know, that is supportive of community. Yeah. And not and obviously and not making too many rules like you know, we're not like a company share where you've got to get approval from the committee or, you know, and you can't, it has to be owner occupier, you can't rent, those kind of things. We're not going down that road, but we're trying to be in the middle. Um, yeah, interesting, Earthsong have a thing where when you want to sell your um, your house that you, you have to, um, the seller has to get the buyer to become a member of Earthsong, yeah. which means that, you know, there's a whole process of, participation and meetings and kind of fit and and I imagine that if somebody was really interested like really wanted to buy in but really didn't want to kind of buy into the whole ethos that they could probably you know um outfox the system but I'm not sure why they'd bother yeah. so <laughs> I hope that that will be the, the same for us and, and just one last question as an ex-valuer what did you pay for the site uh so we paid um 2.25 okay 
Yeah. And, and, and final, final comment, Zola, is I'd just like to say to Bronwyn, you're obviously the burning soul and um, to, and I think you're a legend for what you've done. It's a massive project, massive undertaking. Um, yeah, and obviously still a little bit of burning still to come, I predict. Yeah, sadly, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've got, you know, I've got an awesome team. And so, which is a double-edged sword, right? Like I love these people and I... And I want to, and I want to do this with them, and so that actually ups the stakes, but it also makes it even more worthwhile. Yes, a very quick one, Bron. When I was just interested to know of the the group, um, what sort of percentage of them are, are people who are involved in the construction or design building industry? So, I spotted a few familiar. Um, <laughs> faces. Really architect faces. Yeah. <laughs> so Jesse Matthews, who's my co-founder, so he's uh -huh. he's the architect and he's going to live there as is his fiance and his parents. Yeah. Um and uh we've got um Anna Farrow from yeah. First Light Studios. Yeah, so she's she's gonna live there. Yeah. And uh we've also so then and we've got a few um retired engineers and okay. You know, and um, the reason I ask is just um, around, I imagine that um, it's easier to get group confidence if the people who are involved have got some inside knowledge. You know, it's not, it's not foreign for them and, and understand a bit more about why the individuals who are involved, what's been their, their journey into the group. It is really, um, it's really interesting because, um, you know, and although we're a collective and we do consensus decision making, I feel the burden of leadership <laughs> because, mm -hmm. because I, because I've taken this role as the project navigator and I, I feel like it, because it's, because we need momentum, we need to keep, you know, there are some cold, hard decisions that need to be made and that we, we need Although we need to take people along with with us, we also just we need good information and we need to to make good decisions in a timely way. Um, so this kind of balance between um, making people feel confident that we are a competent organisation, yeah. so that they are included in, and that because you know sometimes there are questions that are about people's opinions, and we really want that, right? We really want what do you value? What is it that you think is a good idea? What do you um, what do you want to see? What are you afraid of? What are you, that kind of stuff. And then we've got some technical things where it's like, actually, we're going to do a lightweight timber roof instead of a SIPs panel roof. And actually, we know we don't want to just talk about that because it's not, you guys are not engineers and you're not architects <laughs> and, and you can choose the color. But <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's a interesting um, and, and interesting from a comms point of view. Like, for instance, at the moment, we have an issue like so we've discovered more contamination in the soil than we had hoped for like we knew we had some but it's worse than we thought and so how much do we communicate how much do we frighten the horses by going ah disaster and how much do we go actually we've just got to work through a process we need more information like so we've gone with the we've told people and and the information is all available like if people want to come and you know want to look at the the drawing you know look at the the tables of the exceedances and what have you, they can do that. But no. so, yeah. I don't so. think we've had many takers for that. <laughs> Not so much, no. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, um, yeah, that sense of um, transparency and trust building, but then, yeah, and also not yeah. not exhausting people because overwhelm is a real thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, my question is probably not going to fit, but I'll put it out there just like Zola said, because we're looking at, um, it's all, the, the zoning is for us with the tiny houses and it's like something so unusual, like there's this um, subdivision where they do 250 square meter lots. Um, mm -hmm. 250 square meter would be plenty to put a tiny house on there. But you wouldn't be allowed, like there would be development, the, the, the developer would have the covenant on it that you have to have a minimum house of whatever, 160 yeah. square meters or something. Yeah. So we're always grappling with the council 
zoning and uh, um, what can you do, what can't you do. And it's just such a gray area with tiny houses. Everybody's like, you know, no one's saying anything. And council knows, they definitely know what we're doing, where we are. But if no one complains, they're just going to turn a blind eye. And it's just not a very satisfying situation for us to be in because if a neighbor complains, we could just out of there, we have to leave. So for us, it's really important to get that buy-in from councils around doing stuff a different way, but there's so many hurdles. Yeah. Like yeah. the rating system as it is, it's mm -hmm. just all, oh. yeah. I, I think, I mean, to, to um, address the, the higher question is, I, I just think there are so many existing interests in development and housing in New Zealand that the government is just not, the government or councils are just not willing to acknowledge. And they basically, they don't want to upset people with lots of money and people with an investment in the system staying as it is. Yeah. You know, the reason that, that you know, you have 160 square meter minimum on a site is that when people buy a, ho a house site, they see it as this big capital investment and therefore they don't want anybody building something next to them that's mm -hmm. going to endanger their investment. Yeah. And until we have the conversation that there, there needs to be this intermediate housing sector that's not about profit and that's not about capital increase, then until we do that and start to say, actually, if we can modify housing and we make it about capital investment, then we, you're fine if you're playing that game if you're playing that game and you get the, you get your house and you and you get all these these benefits but if you can't get into that game then you're you're nowhere mm. and, and that's the conversation that we keep not having and when mm. i mean i don't get me wrong i love jacinda but when she starts to talk about oh it's about supply side I'm like yeah, it's supply side if you're talking about homes it's not supply side if you're talking about homes and investment because the appetite for investment is endless and when people are being you know, when people want decisions to be made that protect their investment, mm. as opposed to providing homes, yeah. then people are playing two different games. And, um, and I think, you know, the tiny house, because as you say, it's, it's just not as greedy. And it's not as it, it's about creating a, a life and a home in a community, not necessarily a capital asset. Yeah, that's why you're playing a different game. Yeah. And that's and they, well, it's not just council, it's it's the yeah. existing self-interest mm -hmm. of all of those other people who are playing the capital gain game. Yeah. The neighbourhood, yeah. the yeah. neighbourhood who then complains and goes, yeah. you are devaluing my place, get yeah. out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but they're, they're all in it up to here with their mortgage as well. Mm. So <laughs> it's a crazy it's, game. Yeah, and that, that's the, the difficult thing, right, is that we all make decisions on the basis of an existing policy framework and we have no guarantee that that framework will stay the same, but then we fight tooth and nail to keep it the same so that our decision was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's not helpful for change. No. Yeah. So thank where do we you. start? Yeah, thank you, Anya. Well, come and join us at the Society for Alternative Housing Development if you're not there. I am, there, I'm oh, in good, there. Good. I'm in there, I've joined. Yeah. We do have a policy uh, group and we are you know, working actively to make those relationships with the people that are making those decisions and just to keep this conversation going. And yeah, we'll have to come up with some more policy strategy um, so that we can figure figure out these kinds of, uh, you know, where community looks different. Um, how do we get that voice to the table? So thank you for bringing that. It's really important as well. So my question, um, a couple of them have been answered, but um, I'm looking at translating what you have done in the urban area to the country area. Mm. And um, the property I've bought is down a street it doesn't have close neighbors and it's oh it's just absolutely heaven <laughs> but um learning from you how you're doing it in the middle of suburbia is very interesting for me to see how we're going to possibly turn this place in so mm. i haven't bought it as an investment in money i have bought it as an investment in people that's fantastic yeah i just um I mean, one of the things about our project that I do really like is the fact that because we're urban, all of our members have existing networks. Like we're not actually trying to take them away from their from their work or their families or their hobbies or whatever. Like we're, we're providing another layer 
to their to their lives, right? They're going to live in the building, but they're still, you know, that. And and in some ways, I think what you're planning and what what Robin did at, at Earth Song, um, you know, the the moving people to kind of a new context is more challenging. I think you you do have to um, you, you attract more courageous people, right? Because they're they're willing to make a big change in order to come and participate in your project. But I I think it's probably similar in terms of trying to just refine, to refine what it is that binds you together, what it is that you have in common. And I think also this idea that, that you need some private spaces and some shared spaces so that it's, it really is about that, you know, that there are, there are, you accommodate people's need for privacy and for, you know, personal space. And then you make the transition from that into the shared space and the and what's possible in the shared space that's not possible by yourself, you you make that easy. So um, and I think in that way you attract a broader group of people because you say, look, you, you we don't have to agree on everything all of the time. What we're doing together is this, and what we do separately is you know occurs in that other private space that that still exists. Ellie, I just, I, just a further thing. I, I think, um, I think when you've got the um, environmental and therefore all the sort of the technical and political aspects of that, as well as the community building, it does make it a, a kind of a bigger, a more complex question. You know, it's, um, and I think that Earth Song had that because of because of their really strong environmental driver they they tried a lot of experimental things and some of them didn't work and that was really challenging and um our project is probably more focused like we definitely have environmental goals and aspirations but the community and the demonstrating density done well and you know and resident-led projects is kind of more of our driver than than the you know than the environmental things so we've, that's how we've balanced that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Ian, you had a question? Um, yes, thank you very much, Bronwyn. I've been watching your project and have been impressed with the speed with which it's gone. So that's, you've provided some of the clues as to how you've managed that. So that's good. And I'd be very keen to see the learnings coming through. Hopefully you'll be sharing that with the society and we can move forward a lot. Um, I was involved in a community cooperative development as my first one and yes, the whole decision-making in community and underfunding caused the death of that after 20 years. Um, so now I'm at the other extreme of trying to do sort of a developer led approach, mm -hmm. um, but as a social enterprise. Right. So that middle ground between the um, developer led and the community led, um, but in order to get it happening fast, because, you know, as has been mentioned, we can't rely on burning souls and community processes to do make any change. And I'm very much focused on the affordable end. So right. single story detached is is my view because yes, all the people that are doing multi-story attached have big numbers attached to the the build costs and, and it's just like we're never going to get affordable solutions, I don't think, at in that development. Unless we've got yeah, you know, government money or free land, you know, community land trusts or something else changing the game with the current game in a city is not going to be affordable mm -hmm. um, by my view of the word affordable. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, sure. And so, yes, everything. So yes, keep going, set another example, spread the news and between us, yes, we'll collectively change the view of what acceptable housing is and, and right. get more of these models out there. Yeah. That, that's awesome. I mean, I just, I just think that we, we have to, to kind of come at it at mul from multiple angles, and anything that kind of furthers that idea that that housing is about homes, and and that if we commodify that, then we're going to exclude some people, and we're going to reap the whirlwind, right? We're gonna, we're gonna, if we don't, um, you know, if we price people out of the housing market, you know, and they are have substandard homes that's it's just going to be worse for all of us so it's really great that you're doing something you know in that space 
Yeah, I just wanted to add, going along with Ian, I'm starting to hear more of people with a development background who are interested in keeping housing affordable, bringing in the ecological and the social connectedness. I know with the term pocket neighborhood, that is usually where a developer is the main lead, but they do still um, obviously get resident input and they do have that connected, that pocket um, is the design of how the neighborhood looks using shared and common spaces. Um, and then sometimes a community land trust operates in that way as well. They're sort of like a nonprofit developer if it's a greenfield site where there's uh, many houses being built it, at once. So yeah, there's some hybrid models between only resident led and developer led. We can look at how could it look with a mixture where Ian has uh, said social enterprise. Um, and we need to look at yeah, how are they classified so that they get the benefit of being able to give affordability, give resident a lot of input and yet ease the burden um, to not have it all fall on the shoulders of the residents to have you know, that development uh, skill set and, and time, energy, um, as you say, to be able to take a risk. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we need to look at a whole bunch of hybrid stuff and more partnership models to be able to allow for anyone who wants to live in a place where they want to help to create what it's going to look like in the end and have a, a, either an affordability or an ecological piece um, that we find a way to make that uh, possible. So we have um, gone 10 minutes over our time, but I think it's been a good use of time because we've had some extra questions and some input from folks um, that have been helpful. So I will end it here, but it's not the end of this conversation by any means. I'd like to touch base with some of you to figure out you know, how we can continue to work together and collaborate. Co you know, join the Society for Alternative Housing Development, subscribe to the Common Ground newsletter, um, there's also that cooperative housing. You can be a member of that as well if that's the, the model that you like. Um, and um, then we can carry on and see what, uh, if you have a um, suggestion of another presentation I can put on or some other kind of event, I'd be happy to collaborate on, um, on this kind of uh, next event. So thank you all very much for coming and I look forward to seeing you around at the next presentation or in person.